This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We're on the road in San Francisco, California, where we're continuing our 100-city tour and our conversation about the 2014 police killing of Alex Nieto, as well as a slew of other police killings. Mario Woods, Emilcar Perez Lopez, and now Luis Gangora, a homeless man who was killed just last Thursday. Three of four of these killings happened in San Francisco's rapidly gentrifying neighborhoods, the Mission District and the adjacent Bernal Heights. We're going to talk about the link between these killings and gentrification in San Francisco with author Rebecca Solnit, who wrote a piece called Death by Gentrification, and community organizer Adriana Camarena. This is part two of our conversation. In the first part, we particularly focus on the death of Alex Nieto and a recent jury decision um, to acquit the officers who killed him of excessive force. And we also talked about the killing of um, a homeless San Francisco man named Luis Gangora. Um, so, Adriana, we ended the first part of the conversation by talking about how you're organizing. What are the groups that are dealing with these killings, and what do they have in common? Um, there have been other groups before the Justice for Alex Nieto um, coalition that formed in 2014, and uh, like the Idris Deli Foundation, the Kenneth Harding Jr. Foundation. And now, with each killing, we have new coalitions forming um, with community members, neighbors, family. You now have um, the Justice for Amilcar Perez Lopez, which is a group of neighbors who did an extraordinary job of putting together the first witness accounts. And unfortunately, Amilcar was literally killed in front of my house. So I was then part of a, another case. Before um, we go further, right. for those mm -hmm. who didn't see part one, and they should go to our website to see it, but. Um, Explain very briefly what happened to Alex Nieto, um, March 21st, 2014, and then what happened to Emil Carr. Alex was uh, eating a burrito in the park around sunset on March 21st, 2014, uh, just before he went off to work um, at his job as a, night, a nightclub uh, security guard. And he was wearing his uh, work taser on his hip. and. Uh, the short version is that two, two people passed by. They saw the, the taser at his hip, became concerned, and called 911. Alex was, didn't actually engage with them um, at all, but they proceeded to inform 911 of his location. The police arrived, um, and two officers first arrived, and they, those first officers unloaded two clips and then reloaded and kept on shooting for a total of 43 bullets before two other officers arrived and shot 60 more bullets. You That's have two things. He was carrying a taser, which right. he used for work, and he was wearing his 49ers jacket and a baseball cap, but they yes. were red. Right. And they were red. And so the description, which was um, actually elicited by the dispatch caller was, what is he, you know, where is he, what is he wearing, what race is he? And so the description that was sent out to police is that they were looking for a Hispanic male, six feet tall, 200 pounds, wearing a red jacket, and a gun at his hip. And so with that description, they were basically setting up Alex Nieto to be killed because he was prof he could easily be profiled by police as um, a Norteño gang member. Because they were red. Because they were red. But they don't consider the rest of San Francisco that wears these red uh, 49ers jackets to be gang members. Exactly. Um, one of Alex's close friends, Ben Baxiera, said, what if it had been a white person in a jacket? Would they have taken him for an off-duty cop, right? So he was killed by police March 21st, and right. a trial just acquitted them of excessive force. Yes. What happened to the man, Emil Carr, who was killed in front of your house? When was this? This was February 26, um, 2015. So um, almost a year later, um, Amir Carr there, uh, is a, was a day laborer, 21-year-old uh, Guatemalan man uh, from Shorty, indigenous descent. And he lived in a house in, in, across the street from, from us. And so, because day laborers would congregate outside the house, and so he was having a confrontation with somebody who took his cell phone. And so he—this person walked away with his cell phone, the person had a bicycle, 
And so to understand these are people who don't speak Span English, sorry, sometimes not even Spanish. But he took a knife from his house and was wanted to impress upon this person to give him back his, uh, his cell phone. At that point, there were two undercover cops who came up behind him, uh, did not identify themselves. He, they jumped him, and he had the natural reaction of uh, wriggling out. He didn't know what was happening. He dropped the knife that was in his hand, and he ran away from them. <coughs> But what happened is, uh, what I know from eyewitness accounts, is that they, he, the police officer dropped the flashlight he had in his hand, and so his reaction was to immediately stand up and shoot him. And so what's remarkable about this version is that the um, immediate version of police is that Amirka Lopez uh, Perez was lunging at police officers, but very um, uh, smartly, the, the lawyers who took the case did immediately an autopsy, and the finding is that there were six shots to the back. Six shots in the back? Um, yes. And what was really impressive about it was that the office and the police said from the immediately and into the town hall meeting that their version of events was that America had lunged at them with a knife. Um, but the autopsy uh, showed that all shots were to the back. And so what did the police say once the autopsy came out? Um, they, they have sustained their version. They have now shifted slightly to say that he was turning. That, and, but we all know that when the police put out a statement, it is, um, it's a fictional narrative. It's a narrative that is adjusted to the legal standards, which is basically that they felt a threat and they feared for their lives. So what's really important is sometimes to hold them to those accounts, because over time, as evidence comes forward, that narrative will fall apart. So <clears throat> that's the story of Milcar Perez Lopez, and right. no one was held accountable in his killing. Well, in this case, we're waiting um, to see if the district attorney is actually going to press charges in this case. There is rumblings that he might. When was Milcar killed? On uh, February 26th of 2015. So why has it taken so long? This is more than a year later. Yes, it's um, it usually they usually for, wait for the autopsy report that I think was just released a f um, around his anniversary. Um, and so we are re literally waiting for the uh, for the district attorney to and to make a statement. There's pressure right now. Mario Woods, what happened to him on December 2nd? This is a ex very well-known story in San Francisco, but not as well-known nationally, although it was raised by some of the Super Bowl dancers with Beyonce, who held up a sign, Justice for Mario Woods. Exactly. And, yes, it's very well-known in San Francisco. In this case, we there's actually a video of bystanders where you see Mario uh, being surrounded by approximately five officers, and you can see him literally um, cowering and walking against um, a wall. Uh, he's not being aggressive. He—you can see he's terrified. And what happens is that one of the officers moves into his line of, of where he's walking. At that moment, there's a release of a barrage of bullets from all of them. I've heard the number 20, 20 bullets. Um, and we see Mario die in, in, in the video, and it's very shocking and traumatic for those who view this video or everybody who is there present. And where did this happen? This happened in the Bayview neighborhood. And um, in this case, the police were asked, why did so many shoot us? Clearly, he wasn't a threat. And the answer the chief of police said is that there's a thing called sympathetic fire. And so, basically, there's sympathy for other officers firing, but not for one man surrounded by all these officers. Mm -hmm. And so there has been a strong coalition and co other community organizers, including the, uh, the coalition for uh, the 3 percent coalition, who is focused also on gentrification, looking into the case of Mario Woods. Mm -hmm. Rebecca Solnit, this piece you wrote, Death by Gentrification, which very much profiles the story of Alex Nieto, um, his death back in 2014, and then this um, civil trial, which may not be familiar to many, the idea that police officers go on trial, but they're not going to face criminal charges. This is a civil suit that the family has brought uh, against them using uh, excessive force. 
though the jury found they did not use excessive force. Were jurors interviewed afterwards about why they felt what they felt? No, some journalists went, at, weren't, went after them but were unable to get interviews. We don't know why they made the decision they did. You also interviewed um, Alex Nieto's boss at the nightclub. He was a bouncer at a nightclub. Talk about how he described Alex. Yeah, he was a uh, worked at a nightclub. Is it El Toro? I'm suddenly forgetting the name. Yeah, uh, that has yeah, a Latino immigrant population going there. It can get very rowdy. Sometimes they have as many as nine security and bouncer guys working there. We went to talk to his boss after the trial because I still felt like, okay, they're talking. Of, you know, the police story is that he was mentally ill, et cetera. And it's like, how could you work as a bouncer? if you like, were unable to deal with stress and make decisions in conflict, et cetera. His boss could not say enough good about him. He adored Alex. He just deeply admired him. He loved how he could really defuse conflicts. He was a peacemaker. He would take people who were drunk and rowdy out in ways that didn't, weren't macho, didn't increase the conflict, was really good at just like a really peaceful, calming presence, a real kind of hero in that space. And his boss couldn't believe that he would, would do that with a taser and can't believe this happened. Hmm. And clearly just values and honors him deeply. So let's pivot to the larger issue of gentrification that you raise, your piece headlined Death by Gentrification. Three of the four cases that we have looked at, we previously talked about the killing of the homeless man, Luis Gangora, just last week. Um, Talk about where they took place in San Francisco and what's happening here. Mario Woods was killed in the Bayview District, which is a historically black neighborhood in southern San Francisco. The other three killings, uh, to, uh, the two non-English speaking immigrants were killed in the Mission District, a historically Latino district with deep roots and really strong, beautiful Latino culture. And Alex was killed in the joining neighborhood that's really part of the mission in many ways, Bernal Heights. And the gentrification, you know, what you, the feeling you get from the community is that we're being pushed out in many different ways. We're being pushed out by evictions, by unaffordable housing, by the destruction of churches and businesses, bookstores, social services, nonprofits, et cetera, making way for a culture, you know, for new enterprises that serve a new incoming population of young, mostly white, mostly white male tech workers. So you're really having the wholesale replacement of one culture by another. And in the Mission, which is a really culturally rich place with really deep roots, really deeply meaningful, I think, for the United States Latino uh, sort of cultural identity as a whole, you know, this destruction is particularly painful. People are losing something, a sense of connection, a sense of community, a sense of memory and history. And it's really kind of like a lobotomy for the neighborhoods as everything that makes people connected to the past, to each other, to a sense of meaning, to an identity gets stripped away and it all turns into a kind of shiny new uh, kind of place that could be any place in the developed world. Uh, you have written that Alex Nieto may have been killed in part because he grew up in a multicultural neighborhood where he dared to think that he belonged. That, you know, it's very hard since Alex is not available for interviews, but the sense that I get from many of his friends and from knowing people who grew up right around him, some of my closest friends did, is that, you know, when he grew up, Bernal Heights was multi ethnic, including white people. But it was, re but people were really comfortable being around diversity, and the sense I get of him is of somebody who felt like he was an insider, felt at home, assumed that people respected him and respected his right to be there, and that he wasn't really prepared for outsiders who saw him as an intruder, as somebody who didn't belong, as somebody who didn't have the right to be there. His parents lived in this neighborhood for how many decades? Adriana, let me put that to you. You've become very close to them. They lived in one uh, apartment, one house, for how many years with Alex and his brother? Um, after they married, Refugio and Elvira Nieto moved into their home on Cortland Street in 1984. So since then, it's, they've and lived raised there. Their two and boys. they raised their two boys there, Hector and Alex.
And what happened to Hector, Al um, Alex's brother, after Alex was killed? Uh, he sat next to his parents in the courtroom. Yes, absolutely. He was there every day. He's a very quiet, reserved uh, young man. And he, but he stood there and he took on the information, and he and I would sometimes debrief a little bit, but he basically understood that there was a version of, of the narrative the police were telling about his brother that was truly false. Mm -hmm. And moving forward, um, in terms of gentrification and police sweeps of the homeless, Luis Gangora just last week, a homeless man being killed. And he was killed in which neighborhood? He was also killed in the mission. And for me, this is really a death by gentrification story, because first he's evicted from his home. And of course, there's incredible competition for the incredibly expensive housing. And an, an immigrant laborer was not going to compete successfully. So he became homeless, lived in a tent, established himself in a kind of tent community as a kind of beloved and trusted and kind member. Uh, was uh, Some of the people who lived in houses around really liked and trusted him. And so there's a sense of people being pushed further and further. First, he's pushed out of his home. Then the mayor, particularly when the Super Bowl happens, pushes the homeless out of places they've traditionally been and steps up the harassment of homeless people, 71 percent of which, as I said earlier, were uh, previously uh, housed in San Francisco. And then the police come and shoot him, and he's just driven out of this life altogether. And the Super Bowl, what happened as a result of the Super Bowl or the plans for it to happen? It was so ridiculous. The Super Bowl uh, actually happened in Santa Clara in Silicon Valley. The 49ers have moved south. But uh, to make the city look pretty for the uh, newcomer, for the visitors, for the tourists, um, the mayor decided to do massive sweeps of the homeless. And so, like, a whole new level of persecution began, where people were pushed out of a lot of other neighborhoods. Many of them moved south of Market, which is adjacent to the Mission and to the Mission. It's been a very rainy, wet winter, so they're living in tents. The tents were confiscated and trashed. One of the really painful things we saw was a disabled veteran who re re required a walker to get around. We saw his walker thrown into a garbage truck and compacted. People are losing their medicines, their possessions, their identity, their phones. You know, all their belongings are just thrown away. And so, there's, so it's a real kind of purge. And where are these people supposed to go? They have no place to go. Uh, this was just in this morning, published this morning. A sixth witness disputes police account of homeless man's killing in San Francisco, uh, Luis Gangora's killing. She says he appeared relaxed and was not posing a threat to anyone before officers shot and killed him. We have a lot of witnesses who say he was not a threat and uh, they conflict with the police story. The police claim that there are three witnesses supporting their version. But no journalist has ever heard. We've never heard from them. We don't know their names. They haven't appeared. We don't know if they exist. And as Adriana and I have been telling you, the San Francisco police don't have a great reputation for truthfulness right now. Adriana Camarena, you are a community organizer. You've been very close to the Nietos. Um, during the trial, you sat with them. You helped translate. You're also a lawyer, well, in Mexico. Um, and you are now trying to document what is taking place in your communities here in San Francisco. Can you describe what happened to you on Saturday night as you tried to film? Sure. One of the things that we've learned, unfortunately, through these cases is that it takes the neighbors to get the first account of these shootings right, because we know that the narrative of the police is that they were threatened and had to shoot for their lives. So I, as soon as I could, um, on the night that he was killed, I made a first round and introduced myself to the residents of the homeless encampment. And after this that— This is when Luis Gongora was killed. Yes, when Luis Gongora was killed on Thursday, April 7th. And so after that, I returned, um, and we exchanged numbers. And so now they had my numbers, um, two, of the wit uh, two of the witnesses. And, when ha and I told them, if you need help, just call me. So it's Saturday night, I'm already ready to go to sleep, and they call around 11 p.m. to say that they, the cops have arrived with sticks, they're hitting on the tents, they're, they're 
they're pushing them out. So I put a call out. I blasted out a call saying, whoever can go out there right now, come out and observe what's going on. So by the time I arrived, um, it was closer to midnight, maybe 11.30 into midnight. Um, and I started filming. And um, I did see the cops tearing down tents. What I learned that had happened is that many of the homeless people who are terrified of contact with police, as soon as they arrived, they fled. So the police officers, were, there weren't that many, maybe about four. Um, so some people have said up to six, but I saw four. Um, they, st they targeted the tents that were unattended. One of them belonged to another one of the witnesses. And they literally dismantled, slashed them, tore them apart. And it really felt like a retaliation, because they just targeted um, the homeless people on that block, on shop from 18th to 19th streets. And there were homeless people around the corner, and basically they didn't actually even pick up. The remains of these uh, structures were left there for the homeless people on a rainy night to pick up during the night. And so as I was filming there, I also had an interaction with one of the officers uh, who resented my filming, and so he flashed a, um, a flashlight into my face, and I asked him, um, uh, are you doing this so I can't film you? And he responded, uh, no, I'm doing this because you are pointing an object at me, and I am concerned for my safety, which is basically the language that police officers use to pull out their guns and shoot people. Now I want to go to the clip of you, Adriana Camarena, filming the police in San Francisco dismantling this homeless camp shortly after Luis Gongora's, Luis Gongora's killing. So you're flashing your camera, your flashlight at me so that I can't record? Is that the idea? You're concerned about your safety after there was a police shooting on this block? Yeah. Yes? Especially, after that. Especially because it's on video that you responded, your colleagues responded within 30 seconds by shooting beanbags and then bullets. You are the danger on the streets. You are the danger on the streets, you said to the San Francisco police. Yes, that's exactly how I feel and how many of uh, my members of a, in the coalitions and also just neighbors at this point feel. It's dangerous that they are so reckless about their use of force, and I think they have become brazen, especially after the Alex Nieto trial. They feel emboldened to use um, their weapons, because no charges have come from the district attorney, and the case uh, was not successful, but it was successful in pointing out their behavior. The California primary is coming up on June 7th. Are these issues of police brutality, of police killings, being raised at the higher levels of government? Or is the movement you feel coalesced enough that this will become a presidential campaign issue? What I have been able to—the only instance that I've seen so far is that, on, precisely on the Facebook page for Luis Gongora, also known by his nickname, Willy Gongora. Um, a supporter for Bernie Sanders has mentioned a uh, hashtag movement for, uh, for Bernie that they will respond to the shootings in San Francisco. So it could be possible that that's coming up. We do have local candidates with different positions on the issue running for the state assembly. And Calo San Francisco is like a pretty nearly 100 percent Democratic Party, but there's a real schism between. Uh, the people serving the tech corporations and the wealthy elite. And uh, for, in the assembly race for San Francisco, that's represented by Scott Wiener and by Jane Kim, who's much more on the populist side of the divide in city politics. It's so interesting the way uh, these stories are um, uh, described. So often, the person who is shot by police seen as the threat—and this is something you referenced, Adriana. Rebecca, what about this? You know, what was interesting to me when I was charged with not saying enough about Alex Nieto's mental illness, which I actually didn't say anything about in my Guardian piece, because nothing convinced me that he had any mental illness. And if the evidence of that was supposed to be that he pointed his taser at the police and the only outside witness says he didn't, then forget that story. What I suddenly realized with my experience with rape stories, something I've covered a lot, 
is that the victim gets put on trial, the victim is treated as the guilty one, the victim undergoes character assassination, a lot of red herrings are thrown out about things that are irrelevant. We heard about Trayvon Martin's high school, uh, you know, suspension. We heard about Eric Garner's arrest record for nonviolent, petty sort of harassment offenses. We And so there is this weird way where who's guilty? I mean, are you guilty of being shot by the police? But all this evidence comes up to prove, to justify what the police did. And the other similarity for me between these police stories and the rape stories that I've covered so often, nobody ever shows up in court and says, yeah, I totally raped that person. Nobody, the police never show up and say, oh, hell yeah, that was excessive use of force. Oh, hell yeah, we violated that person's civil rights. So, of course, they always say that there was a threat, that it was justifiable, et cetera, and then start uh, trying to convince people to not care about this person, to not value this person, to not believe the people who stand up for this person. And that's kind of routine. And there's a way in which you should look at all the evidence and form your own opinion, and there are, justif there, there are justifiable homicides in, like, hostage situations and things like that. But uh, in these cases where it's kind of a given that you'll be told that this was a very bad person who was doing very terrible things. Adriana, finally, in the case of Alex Nieto, the man who made the original 911 call, uh, though he hadn't even seen Alex, his partner had seen Alex, and he was concerned that the taser looked like a gun. Um, he attempted to apologize at the trial to Alex Nieto's parents? Yes, he, he did apologize. Um, I was there with the Nietos. It was during a recess after he had testified. He came straight at them, and I'll try to recall what he said, but he, he said that he was very sorry for the loss of Alex, um, that no parent should have to go through what they went through, and that he just wanted to tell them how sorry he was. And at that moment, um, I was— uh, the Nietos got a translation of the apology, and they had different reactions. And the father immediately took his hand and embraced him. And he later, Refugio later told me that for him, um, he heard Alex saying that even in facing some of our, our the people who hurt us, you have to sh take the higher ground. His mom, on the other hand, um, heard the apology, but she wasn't in the place to hear it uh, or, you know, to, to accept it or to allow herself to be touched. And since I'm, I, I am studying restorative justice, I would say that that was appropriate, and each victim has their journey, and I respect the parents very much, each, uh, each, of one, each one of them, for their reaction. I want to thank you both very much for spending this time talking about what's happening in your communities. Um, Adriana Camarena is a community organizer, a lawyer in Mexico. Here, she is working with families who have been victimized by police. And, Rebecca Solnit, we're going to link to your piece, uh, Death by Gentrification, that you did for The Guardian. Rebecca Solnit is a well-known author and writer, acclaimed uh, all over the United States. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.